the Ovidian elegiac couplet, what we're now turning to. I say Ovidian because there's a particular purity about Ovid's method of composition that I think is worth understanding and trying to imitate, even if we don't, in fact, choose to follow it as, um, exclusively, as exclusively as Ovid himself does in our own writing. In other words, let's have a go at doing it the Ovidian way, even if, in fact, we later prefer to do it, say, the Catullan way or the way of anybody else. There are plenty of things, of course, that Ovid shares with um, other writers of elegiac couplets. The difference, I think, comes down to the ends of the pentameters, how the couplet closes, and Ovid's practice almost exclusively of ending with a two-syllable word in the pentameter. Now, ending pentameters with two-syllable words is the norm overall. It's certainly the majority of endings in all writers of elegiac couplets. It's the most normal ending. But other poets are quite happy to use uh, three or four syllable words at the end, and why not, from their point of view, about the most famous of all uh, epigrams, Catullus's poem, 85, Odiat Ammo, ends with a polysyllabic word, excrucior, uh, so do many other elegiac couplets. But nevertheless, um, learning how to do it, the Ovidian two-syllable way, I think is really quite useful. It concentrates our minds a bit. I'm sure from Ovid's own perspective, it was a, a self-imposed restriction. He knew perfectly well he could do it in another way, but he just chose not to. And it really is quite striking how, I don't say absolutely exclusively, but almost exclusively, Ovid does it this way. There are a number of lines in his later exile poetry, rather more lines than in the earlier poetry. Earlier poetry. There are a number of lines where, for particular reasons, particularly for using names, he will break this rule. The pentameter, on the other hand, does divide exactly in the middle two and a half and two and a half. And the first half, of course, consists of two flexible feet, either dactyls or spondees. So that's where your flexibility comes. So the first half of the pentameter is exactly like the first half of the hexameter. It gets you up to the caesura. In this case, a very rigid caesura there. We've got a half foot which just hangs there. It doesn't continue in beyond the caesura. And those two half feet added together make up the fifth foot of the pentameter. The second half, of course, is rigid in the sense that it's got to be dactyls, no variation allowed. And if you're Ovid, it's also got to be a two-syllable word at the end. So the challenge of the pentameter is making sure that we can get our second half right and that we can get our two-syllable word right. But the end is by far the most difficult part, I think, and it really is pretty wise to decide what you're going to say at the end of the pentameter as a priority, near the beginning of thinking about what you're trying to say in the couplet as a whole. And it's also pretty wise to think of them in terms of couplets rather than individual lines. You run on very often from the hexameter to the pentameter. That is desirable and common. What you don't do is run on from one pentameter to the following hexameter. And of course, the ending is also the point make the end punchy, make it count, and put words of some significance there. OK, well, let's consider how we do it. So we're thinking not only of the last word, but of its connection with the previous word. So if our last word starts with a vowel, we need a word before it which ends with a consonant and is also naturally short at the end. If our last word starts with a consonant, we need a word before it which is naturally short at the end and ends with a vowel. There's really no getting, away, getting around that issue, particularly if we refuse to elide in the second half of the pentameter, which again is good practice, I think. Again, I wouldn't say that Ovid never does it. I'm sure he does, but it's pretty rare. And it is rather ugly. I mean, the, the actual ugliness of the sound does depend very much what you're eliding into what. So, I mean, I can certainly envisage cases where a really good couplet might contain an, an elision in the second part of the pentameter, but best to avoid it. And certainly anything ugly or forced is pretty terrible and very much uh, not recommended. So if we're thinking that we're not eliding, there's really no getting around these problems. You've just got to choose the right words that will fit with these restrictions. So when I talk about working with the restrictions of the Ovidian pentameter, I mean not trying to fight against the couplet 
but embrace it and say, this is difficult, this poses challenges, but these challenges can actually improve the poetry by forcing our minds to be quite clear and logical about what we're doing, to have a clearly thought out point that is often expressed in quite simple words.